Uh, basically, this is going to be an overview uh, of XNA. Uh, you know, we're just going to be covering some of the major pieces and kind of showing you how e you know exactly how easy it is to get started. Uh, how many of you have actually downloaded XNA Game Studio? Okay, so we've we've got a little bit of a handful uh, in the crowd. Uh, this really is that easy. Uh, you know, if you guys have ever been interested or curious or whatever your reasons are to get into game development, uh, it really is fairly easy. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, uh, you guys are hopefully going to believe that. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, uh, you know, aside, uh, uh, aside from just enjoying it, uh, you know, whatever your reasons are, whether you just think game development is cool or you have a, you know, a great game idea that, that you want to build, uh, or, or even if it's, you know, the engineering challenge that, that is the game to you. Uh, you know, there are just a ton of reasons, because games are really very complex kind of uh, creatures, as it were. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a lot to learn. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, when you ask the question, what is XNA? Uh, you kind of have, you know, you have to look at it uh, in the perspective of, you know, what does the rest of the landscape look like? Uh, when you talk about other people in the game industry, particularly professional game developers, uh, most of them are very focused on, on the cross-platform aspect. So, you know, uh, uh, the big studios, they're going to want to build games for the Xbox, the Nintendo, uh, Nintendo Wii, Windows, the PS3, all these things. And they're doing all of this in, in unmanaged code, uh, which, I, I mean, it's great, obviously, and tons of people write in, you know, C++ and all these things. Uh, but, but the reality of it is that, you know, when you move to a managed language, particularly C Sharp, well, this might be a little bit biased, but, uh, you know, things get a lot, a lot simpler. Uh, in the case of Microsoft, you know, they saw that all of these professional game developers, uh, they've made quite an investment in, in multi-platform development. So, you know, uh, when they write a game, they want it to be fairly easily portable to PS3 uh, and the Xbox 360 uh, and Windows and all these other different platforms. Because, of course, if you write it once and maybe just kind of rewrite a few of the lower level parts that talk to the, you know, the, the host platform, you know, they can make more games faster. Uh, so from Microsoft's perspective, uh, you know, they wanted, uh, you know, a cohesive story for their platforms. Uh, so, you know, you'll hear XNA is, is cross-platform, and it is, but of course it's only Microsoft platforms. Uh, <laughs> you've got Windows, which, you know, as I'm sure you guys know, it's, uh, it's very versatile. Uh, a ton of different hardware configurations. Some people might have one processor, some people might have four. Some people might have 256 megs of memory. Some people might have three, four gigs, depending on their configuration. Um, but it also offers, you know, uh, a number of, of pretty nice things. Like, for example, you can connect to any other machine on the internet. Uh, the keyboard and mouse is something that in gaming uh, is fairly unique because, you know, you can't really use keyboard and mouse for the most part uh, on, on the consoles. So, you know, Windows is definitely a very attractive platform for game developers, uh, you know, plus everybody has Windows <laughs> for the most part. Uh, the Xbox, on the other hand, uh, it's, it's a very powerful, uh, very stable platform in the sense that, you know, when you develop something, it's going to run exactly the same on, you know, on this Xbox and on that Xbox because they're all the exact same hardware. Uh, so, you know, this is why game developers really like programming for consoles. It, you know, it's not just the Xbox, it's just really any console. It's a, it's a fixed set, you know, uh, configuration. But the Xbox is really nice. You know, it's got, uh, it's got three cores, uh, each with two hardware threads. Uh, so for a total of six hardware threads. So you can really, you know, parallelize uh, all your code and have maybe your, you know, your AI running on one core, your physics running on another, uh, and you can really, you know, make some really fast games that 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 do a lot. Uh, in addition to that, the the graphics hardware is really nice, um, and unless, you know, uh, one of the great things about XNA is that unless, I mean, previously, and I mean, really with with all the other game consoles. If you actually want to write something for one of those platforms, you have to go through the certification process, and you gotta, you know, you gotta become a registered, you know, registered Xbox developer, and you know they actually look into your corporation, 
make sure that you have the funds to actually go through with a project and things like that. So it's not really open to just anybody that, oh, hey, I want to make an Xbox game. It's, it's, it's just not available. Uh, with XNA, now it is. Um, uh, and we'll go into that a little bit later. Uh, there's a relative newcomer to the scene. There's the, the Microsoft Zune. Uh, you know, and, and the whole thing about this platform is portability. You know, it's, I have one here. It's a little tiny device. Uh, they come in a few different sizes. Uh, you know, one of the great things about this is, you know, if, <laughs> if someday you happen to find yourself in a room with another Zune owner, which may or may not be difficult, um, <laughs> Uh, the great thing about these is that they can actually form an ad hoc Wi-Fi network and actually talk to each other. Uh, and if you write a game, you can play wirelessly against somebody else in the same room that has a Zoom. Um, so from a capability perspective, you know, this little thing's pretty cool. Uh, and you can write games for it now. Of course, it's obviously much more, uh, much more of a constrained uh, device than... Uh, uh, and I'm just going to pass this around. You guys can... I mean, don't steal it, but, you know. Uh, this is... I wouldn't even call this a game, really. It's, uh, uh, it's just a little thing I wrote that just kind of shows off how you can do some stuff uh, if you want to just pass that around. <clears throat> so those are the platforms. Uh, on top of the platforms uh, sits the actual X, uh, XNA framework. Uh, this, is the actual, this is the actual framework. Uh, the great thing about the XNA framework is that uh, what they've done is that they've tried to provide a consistent set of APIs across the different platforms. Because um, if you've ever, you know, anybody that, you know, if, uh, if you've ever considered programming for both Windows and maybe Linux, uh, just to give you an, uh, an example, the, the APIs are, are fairly different depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, the great thing about XNA, in the context of, of games or, or perhaps, you know, uh, interactive simulations or applications, uh, XNA gives you a consistent set of APIs uh, you know, across the different platforms. Uh, of course, certain things are missing from certain platforms, like for example, on the Xbox, you have most of, well, you have mo uh, all of XNA, uh, you have most of the .NET framework, uh, but it's missing certain things, like for example, system.net, because on the Xbox, you can, only, uh, you can only make network calls through Xbox Live. Uh, uh, which is, you know, of course, is one of the great things about XNA. You can actually tap into the Xbox Live network, uh, which is, you know, really fast. You can do matchmaking. You can play against somebody, you know, clear across the world, uh, just, you know, by writing a game in XNA. Well, <laughs> not just by writing it, you know, it's, but um, <clears throat> uh, on top of the framework, you know, the thing that's formerly known as XNA Game Studio, uh, you know, it's basically just a Visual Studio plugin. When you install it, you, uh, you get a few new project templates. Um, there's, there's a portion called the content pipeline, which will largely be out of the scope uh, of this presentation. Uh, we're going to go over it, because obviously we're going to be using it. But uh, that, that really deserves you know, uh, a session or two of its own, because that, you know, that's, that's just another aspect of things. Uh, and then also, you get device management. So one of the great things about XNA, from a developer's perspective, is that Say you're trying to write an Xbox game. Uh, assuming you have the, uh, you know, the appropriate X, uh, Creators Club subscription, which costs 100 bucks a year, which you know, if you're interested in, 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 in writing games for the Xbox, isn't that bad. Uh, it is as simple as, as long as your computer and the Xbox are on the same network, uh, once you set it up, you press F5, it copies your game and all the content over to the Xbox over the network, launches it, and then you, uh, you can put a breakpoint and debug remotely through your code. Uh, from a developer experience perspective, it's great. And it's you know, almost unparalleled with any other platform, like you know, the, PS, the PS2, PS3, whatever. Um, so XNA is really nice. Uh, has anybody here ever done, uh, just kind of toyed around with any unmanaged game development? OK, uh, maybe three, maybe four uh, hands in the crowd. Uh, one of the things, and I'm sure you guys would agree, uh, you know, with unmanaged game development, it's fairly difficult to even get started. Uh, when you start a new project, there's quite a bit of code. And a lot of times, it looks very similar to pretty much every other project you'll do. And it's you know, just calling like making different Windows API calls, and setting up the, the video card, setting up DirectX, and just all these 
different things that's, you know, it's very difficult to learn. And a lot of beginners are, are just kind of put off by that. Uh, with XNA, uh, one of their stated goals was that when you make the new project, your first line of code that you write is for your game. So it's very easy to get, <laughs> to get started. Um, so I'm actually going to try to go through these uh, first few slides fairly quickly, get to the code. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm also going to just not try to go too long here. But um, what we have here is a very fundamental uh, concept that, that once you, you kind of wrap your head around it, uh, you know, you'll understand this goes on in every, um, yeah, pretty much every game that you, you, know, you go to Blockbuster and you rent or anything you download off the internet is pretty much following this exact same pattern, every single game. The, the application starts, you load up some content from the hard drive or in certain cases from, from you know, the, the, digit, the media, optical media, you know, DVD drive and things like that. Um, and once you have things in memory, you can actually start. Uh, it goes into what's called the game loop. Now, the game loop is basically, for all intents and purposes, just an infinite loop until you know, the player decides to get out of the game. And it alternates between two phases, update and draw. In the update phase, you update all of your AI, your physics, uh, everything that makes your game your game. You know, the scoring mechanism, the movement mechanics, uh, you know, everything about your game happens in the update. When it moves over to draw, that's when you actually, you know, you talk to your graphics card. Everything that, that, that the update phase set up, now you tell the graphics card to draw. And this happens every frame. You know, this is going to happen, you know, usually want to target between 30 to 60 frames per second. Uh, so, you know, it's just going to happen continually. Um, so, we're going to start off our, our, our little journey here with just simple 2D game development. Uh, what you're going to find is that XNA, uh, what they've done, is that they've made it very easy for existing game, uh, you know, Windows developers. They've made it very easy to understand, uh, particularly if you're familiar with like GDI Plus, for example. Uh, they've got a 2D coordinate system, you know, X, Y. Uh, the origin is in the top left of the screen. Top left of the screen. <laughs> That's a, uh, the origin's in the top left of the screen, uh, which is just like, you know, just regular Windows GDI programming. And pretty much to draw something, you just need an image or a, a texture and a 2D position. I want to put it here. So, you know, in this case, I want to put it 10 pixels over and 10 pixels down. Very simple concept. So let's see how to do that. And we are going to start. We're going to start from scratch. Uh, I've I've tried my best to keep. Let me see. What's our game? Uh, I've tried my best to keep from having a lot of you know just kind of magic code that you know I kind of copy paste in because I really want to show you guys you know just how easy it is to really get started. And of course, that is entirely the wrong project type. Yeah, there's a format. I'm not going to ask that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, it's an A1 tug game. My mistake. So, when you get started, here's what you have. You have what's called the game class. Uh, now, the, the game class, which uh, in this case game one inherits from, it does a lot of things for you. And for those few of you that have actually done unmanaged game development, you will soon appreciate just how much work actually goes on. So you don't have to worry about you know, losing the graphics adapter when the, you know, the user decides, uh, decides to alt-tab away from your application. You pretty much don't have to worry about any of that, except kind of in some edge cases. But by and large, as long as you're not doing anything too crazy, you usually don't have to worry about any of that. Um, you'll notice uh, you know, it's got a few overridden methods. Initialize, load content, unload content, update and draw, uh, which if we kind of move back here, you'll notice start, load content, unload content, update, draw. Uh, so XNA really just kind of makes it so easy for you to get started. So let's do just that. Now, of the things that I do have, uh, one kind of caveat I'll make is that 
when you start getting into XNA, yeah, yeah go ahead. It is, it is absolutely a single threaded game. Uh, by and large, update will get called first, and then draw will, got, uh, will get caught, uh, called next. And you know, it's just going to alternate like that. Uh, there are a few. There are a few cases because of the way that that you know the actual game class handles the uh, the timing. Like for example, uh, if an update statement or like the render takes maybe a little bit too long to render, what it'll do is that it'll run your update method twice to help you catch up uh, and things like that. These are all things that you would have had to code yourself because, um, of course, you know. Uh, that, 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 that time step is extremely important. And XNA, by and large, you, know, you, you really don't have to worry about it unless you really want to. Um, but actually, that's a good point. There's nothing saying you can't spawn off a new thread uh, and maybe put your physics on that other thread. You know? uh, and especially on, uh, when we're talking about the Xbox, you can actually tell it, look, I want you to run on core 5. Um, you know, and then and then I want my physics to run on six. You know, and of, you know, of course, once you start getting into that, then you have to deal with thread synchronization and uh, all that stuff. But that's uh, perhaps for <laughs> for another day. Um, so, anyways, so so XNA. You know, I've been talking about code and frameworks and the game class and you know, game one class and all this stuff. This is all code. Uh, one thing that you'll quickly learn about game development is that it's it is just you know almost equal parts art, you know. So, you know, for some people that comes really easily, you know, and, and and you feel just as comfortable in Visual Studio as you do in Photoshop, and for other people, uh, it might be a little bit more difficult. Uh, but you know, thankfully with the internet, there's a tons of free resources online, free free textures, free sprites, you know, just a million things that you can use to to kickstart you, and then if you really start getting uh, serious about it, you know, there are people that you can, you know, even locally that you can meet up with and you can, uh, you know, artists and you can start a project together. They can be the art, you can be the engineering, you know, uh, and, you know, it can just be a really nice synergy. But in my case, I'm going to opt with pre existing art. And. All right, so let's. Okay, I brought in a, a simple sprite, and I, uh, I'm going to show you guys how to draw it onto the screen. You come down here, uh, down here into load content. Uh, remember, I mentioned the content pipeline earlier. Well, this is our first usage of it. And, and I'll go back and kind of explain each piece here in a second. Okay. So I'm going to run this, and we're going to see what happens. <laughs> Ship Sprite, of course. Yeah, uh, basically the name of the content is, uh, you can actually rename it, but by default it's just the file name. <laughs> but Ship Sprite. Okay, very simple. By default, you get a blue background, and then it just draws the sprite where you tell it to. Uh, not very, not very exciting per se. So, so what did we do here? Basically, um, there, the content pipeline comes with a lot of kind of built-in types, runtime types. Uh, for example, right here we're using Texture 2D that just represents you know an image. Uh, the content pipeline will take care of uh, pretty much whatever the format is of your image whether it's a PNG or a JPEG or a GIF or whatever, uh, it'll take care of translating it when you actually you know, compile your game. It'll translate it into a format that you can pretty much just take off disk and send it right to the video card. 
So from an optimization perspective, you know, not a whole lot has to happen when you actually say load this piece of content. Um, and that's exactly what we do down here. The, uh, you're going to have this content manager. You just tell it, look, I want a texture 2D and the name of the, te of, of the content is ship sprite. Uh, and it does the magic, which again, uh, you know, I would, I would love to get into, but out of the scope of this. <laughs> um, but after the presentation, you know, I would definitely love to talk content pipeline. Uh, I actually kind of consider myself a little bit more of a tools guy. Uh, I have a, you know, a few projects uh, that I'll show you a demo of later. But anyways, so notice we only did something in draw. Uh, you know, we have this thing called a sprite batch, uh, which is basically how you're going to dr draw most, well, in most cases, this is how you're going to draw 2D things uh, onto the screen. And just because you're making a 3D game, you're usually going to need something in 2D, like for example, menus, or or you know, heads-up display, or s somebody's score, or something like that. So, uh, by and large, you're almost always going to need a sprite batch. And the way it works is that you just tell it, "Look, I want to start." You do a bunch of drawing, and then you say "end." What it does beneath uh, uh, beneath the hood is that it does a, you know a bunch of optimizations. Like for example, if you draw a bunch of things with the same texture, it'll sort them together so that you know, because every time you, 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 you send a different texture to the video card, that's a little bit slower than not doing it at all. So, you know, if they just batch it together, you know, everything that has this one texture, you draw him first, and then you draw the next batch, so on and so forth. That's the name. So, in this particular overload of the draw method, you pass in the texture, you pass in the position, uh, like I was saying, you know, just X, Y position. And then uh, you pass in a color, which can be used to kind of tint your texture. Um, but you know, if you don't want any tint, uh, tinting, you just pass in color.white. Very simple. Um, obviously, this isn't very interesting. Uh, if you want to get some interactivity and some movement in, let's say, let's move our vector position out here. Okay. Now we're going to start looking at the update method, which, you know, as you guys remember, update, draw, update, draw, update, draw. In the update method is where you say, I want this stuff to happen. So, what if we wanted the sprite to move from one side of the screen to the other? Very simple. Position x plus equals 1. Let's see what happens when that runs. Hey, look at that. It's even facing the right way. Yeah, uh, 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 right now, since you're literally only telling this texture, you know, start here and, you know, start moving from here to over there, you know, that's literally all it's going to do. It's, it's going to move right off the screen and it's going to keep going. Uh, you actually have to tell it, you know, in, in certain cases. When it gets over here, I want you to bounce back or, or whatever it is that, that, that you want it to do. Maybe you want it to blow up. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Would it make sense to, to ship a lot of this, all these behaviors into some class, some behavior library? Ab you, would you actually have a 360 project in your solution? Or do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, here's how you do that, actually. You know, uh, I may as well just show you. Um, XNA Game Studio, uh, the way that they have to target the different platforms is that uh, 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 quite literally, you know, on a technical level, there's a different framework for every platform, uh, which is how, you know, you know, on, on, on Windows, obviously, you're referencing just the regular old .NET framework, 3.5. You can use Link if you want to. I mean, if you really wanted to, you can hit a database with Entity Framework and do whatever you want to do because it's just regular .NET code. On the Xbox 360, what they've done is that, you know, they've made a framework. Uh, uh, well, first of all, they're using the Compact Framework CLR, uh, albeit a, a slightly modified version of it for, for the Xbox. Uh, but then they have the actual XNA framework, and they just omitted certain things, like, for example, system.net, just because of security and a, you know, a, a bunch of other things. They can't let an Xbox out to the Internet. Like, you know, th that's just the policy of Xbox Live. So if you want to do any networking, you've got uh, you to use the, the, the Xbox Live APIs. But 
But yeah, so if you want to make, has two options here: create copy of project for Xbox and create copy of project for Zoom. So this is this is the. Well, s well, yes, yes, uh, but here's what I say to that. Technically, uh, uh, in that third-party library, you're still going to need to have, you know, a Zune version and a Xbox 360 version, because, again, the way that the actual project system references, you know, um, like, for example, when you build for the Xbox, it actually doesn't go against MS Core, like corelib.dll and all that stuff. Uh, it goes against specific versions, which actually on Windows, if you use reflection uh, to, to decompile them, like they're all empty. Uh, uh, they're all just the public stubs uh, of those classes because the real implementation of those lives on the Xbox 360. Um, but yeah, uh, one thing that you'll note is that these two projects are actually in the same folder and they're referencing the exact same file. So for example, if I have, well, if I have game one, over here and I open it in the Xbox project, I can do system.net and oh yeah, and there's I mean there's pretty much one interface and one class in the system.net namespace. But if I open the same file from the Windows project, system.net dot and you have a ton of things. So so that's really how the you know, the, the, the cross-project, cross-platform development works. Uh, you know, you author your files. XNA will keep, you know, if you add a file to one, it's going to add it to all the other projects. It kind of keeps that in sync for you. Um, there's a few, uh, you know, there's a few gotchas here and there with it, but uh, it works fairly well. It works fairly well. I should want to close that. So anyways, um, actually, uh, as a corollary to that, uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually going to show you a little bit with a kind of contained behaviors, you know, uh, separate assembly uh, here in a little bit. But <clears throat> all right, so you know, all right, so maybe moving is kind of boring. You know, maybe um, there are certain uh, one of the great things, and and you know, another disclaimer. I'm I'm by no means a mathematician. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm, you know, I, I, there's a lot that I don't know, you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm definitely striving to improve. Uh, so these are, you know, these are things that I've just picked up over the years, and once you learn it, you know, you, it, it kind of sticks with you. But, for example, what if I wanted to, uh, Okay, what happens if I do that? All right, so the sign, and oh, of course I added the Xbox project. Uh, I'm actually going to remove this for now because I don't have an Xbox hooked up. So remove. And it's going to do absolutely nothing. Why is that? Right. <laughs> My mistake. I'm trying to remember. Um, one of the great thing. <laughs> I'm completely not going to remember this. I've got notes here. Oh, right. Ah, why am I not remembering this? Hmm. 
Anyways, moving on. <laughs> Basically, I was just going to make it so that, you know. Is that, is, is that what I wanted to do? No. Maybe. The idea here is that, you know, uh, hmm. anyways, moving on. <laughs> I was basically just going to make it so that, uh, uh, you know, yeah, it was just going to kind of oscillate back and forth, you know, uh, uh, as the time, uh, the game time variable. Uh, that's that's passed into both the update and the draw method. It's actually really handy because uh, you can track, you know, how long has it been since a certain event happened, um, how long has it been since the game started, how long has it been since the last frame, and things like that. So, um, but anyways, we can actually get into more interesting things. <laughs> All right. So, one of the other great things about XNA is that. Uh, dealing with input is actually really easy. So, for example, I've got some paper falling. Uh, I'll just leave that there. Uh, I've got an Xbox 360 controller plugged into my computer. Uh, you can actually, you know, this this works exact. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, back a Yeah. 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 Because because you'd really want to, you know, kind of interpolate. You know, based on the time that the animation started, you know, and the time that's elapsed, you know, I want to be on this frame and so on and so forth. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one, uh, uh, another one of the great things is that, you know, by default, uh, the the game class runs with what's called fixed time step. So you can pretty much be be guaranteed that every time the up uh, the update method is called. It's going to be with you know the same amount of time having elapsed since the last frame, uh, which again by default is something that that you would have had to do on your own uh, with just unmanaged game development or something like that. But uh, you can actually change that if you want, uh, and you know, and there's a number of reasons you might want to. But um, so uh, moving back to to user input, um, this is actually, in my opinion, this is one of the best controllers out on the market right now. It's very easy to use, you know. It has a lot of analog input. Um, all of the analog input, uh, uh, the analog inputs, the two thumbsticks and the two triggers. Uh, essentially, what they'll report is a value. Well, these guys will report a value between zero and one, which is, you know, essentially the percentage that it's pressed in. And these have two axes, x and y, and it'll report between negative one and one based on. The you know uh, the direction it's pressing, so since since the thumbsticks you know it's actually you know a 2D vector, we can actually exploit that and use it for a number of things, for example velocity, which, as you guys may or may not know, velocity is you know it's really just how much I want to change over a certain amount of time, you know my position in a certain direction, so you know like like a velocity could be I'm going 50 miles an hour east or something like that. That's, you know, because I'm going in one hour, I'll be 50 miles in that direction. So basically, if we say pad state, thumbsticks, left. Um, now, uh, you guys will know, uh, uh, if you guys remember uh, the way that, you know, x and y, pointing down is actually positive y uh, on this coordinate system. And if you press down, you actually get a negative one. So for the purposes of our velocity, all we want to do is kind of flip that. So if we do, you just multiply it by negative one. Very simple. Position plus velocity. So with that very simple little thing, of course, that's kind of slow. But you can see. 
you know, I can push it in any direction. I can move it slower or faster. Um, another great thing, another great thing about vectors is that, uh, you know, they've gone through the trouble of, um, of uh, overriding all the operators. So, for example, if I want, you know, uh, this left is essentially going to give me no more than like one one, for example which of course, like that's a fairly slow velocity. But if I say, you know, I want to be going 50 pixels per, per update, then you would basically just, well, 50 is actually kind of fast. Let's say uh, 15 pixels. You just multiply it, and it basically does all, all, uh, all of the vector math for you. And then obviously, it's a lot faster. And like I said, you can move slow, fast, so on and so forth. Let me just pick up all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I think it's thirty, if if I remember correctly. Yeah, you can actually change that. I'm probably going to forget here in front of everybody the actual property, but you would usually do that like in the initialize method. You'd say this dot is it's one of these properties uh, 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 on the graphics adapter. Uh, I don't remember exactly which one because because really. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, like I said, until you really start getting, you know, very complex, you know, you want to just stick with fixed fixed time step. It's 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 just a lot simpler. So, anyways, um, okay. What if so so now we have you know a little ship on the uh, on the screen, uh, but if I run it again, you'll notice it looks it looks kind of silly because it's just pointing in the same direction regardless of the of the direction you move. So again, another little nifty math trick. If we just say, if we get a rotation variable that we can reference in the, uh, in the draw method, and we just say, basically this is saying, if, you know, if I'm moving in a certain direction, I want you to rotate the ship. And here is actually where I'm going to bring in, oh, the velocity is greater than zero. Here's actually where I'm going to bring in uh, my little helper class. Um, and the only reason I'm bringing this in for this is because uh, the sprite batch has an overload, which is where you can actually pass in the rotation. And for the life of me, I can never remember. I can never remember which which overload it is, and it would have taken me like ten minutes. So I just made a uh, an extension method for it. So I bring in a project. This is you know the the shared behavior project that he was re uh, referring to. You bring in a reference. And you add the using so that I can get access to the, uh, and then extension method. There you go. The magic of .NET 3.5, everybody. So now you move it around, and it has rotation. And it's just zipping right around. <laughs> um, you know, one of the great things one of the great things about this is that aside from, aside from me messing up, uh, you know, here ago, uh, this was relatively quick, and this is basically the exact same mechanic as a very popular game on on the Xbox Live Network called Geometry Wars. It's really just a little ship floating around that you can move like this, and he can actually shoot in any direction. Well, okay. What if we wanted to do that? What if we wanted to make him shoot? Okay, here's another kind of very basic, very fundamental pattern. 
is that we can have, oh, and actually at this point, I'm actually going to introduce another, uh, another little helper class from that project I brought in. Um, once, you know, once you really start getting, uh, uh, getting complex, you, uh, uh, you're going to want to start layering the abstractions on, you know, on top of each other. So for example, you know, as you saw, t like to render something, re for the most part, all you need is a texture, a position, and a rotation. Uh, you know, if you want, you know, and you're going to have, like, want to do that for every entity on the screen. So why not just abstract that out into a class? So that's exactly what I've done here with Sprite. And let's call this bullets. So down here, let's say, um, Uh, we're going to use the right thumbstick to decide when we want to shoot and in what direction we want to shoot these things. So just like up top, we say pad state, thumbsticks, right, if shoot length is greater than zero, which means, hey, I want to shoot something, uh, we're basically just going to add a new bullet to the list. And again, using some nifty .NET 3.5 initialization syntax, we can say, look, when you new this bullet up, I want him to be in the exact same position as the ship. I want him to be traveling in the direction that I've decided to shoot. Um, let's, for the, you know, for the ease of, of, you know, sake of easiness, let's use the same exact texture. Let's use the ship. See if I remember. Uh, scale. You can set scale. So maybe let's make him half as big as 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 the actual ship. Oh, we gotta give him. We gotta give him the sprite batch so that he knows how to render himself. Um, do we want to rotate with the the direction of the velocity, which is essentially what we did right up here? Yeah. Sure, why not? And hmm, that's it for now. OK. So, so anytime you do this, it's going to shoot a, or, or it's going to create a new bullet that's moving in that direction. Oh, and actually, if you'll remember, uh, if you'll remember, you can't use the shoot. The, or, or the thumbstick vector directly, so we're kind of we're going to kind of do the same thing that we did up here. We're going to say shoot dot y, and we're going to invert the y, and then we're actually going to make it move faster. So the ship is moving at 15. Let's slow him down a little bit. Let's say he's going to be moving at 10. Maybe these guys move at 12. Um, and of course, you know, this code has a ton of magic numbers all over the place. This is obviously bad practice, you know, it's just for the sake of time. You know, you want to, you usually want to try to make, uh, maybe put these in constants or in a configuration file so you can tweak them or, 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 or give them to a game designer uh, to tweak or something like that. Um, so, of course, you know, as with your day jobs, you want to exercise, you know, good judgment in, in, <laughs> in how you structure the code. But, uh, so let's see how this happens. So when I start shooting, absolutely nothing happens. Oh, of course, we're not drawing it. Well, we're not drawing it or we're not updating the sprites. So we want to do two things. For every, for every bullet, we want to call the update method, which takes a game time in this case. And then down here, we want to say, Now something's going to happen. Ooh. Look at that. But, but that's kind of weird, right? Like, not only is he shooting just a constant stream, but they're all going different velocities. You know, that's, maybe it's kind of abstract. You know, you can make some art. But it's a little weird. <laughs> 
So there's, you know, uh, again, there's a few kind of fundamental patterns that you can use to really fix this problem. One, shoot.normalize. Uh, what this does is that, for example, if you're only pushing just a slight bit in a certain direction, you know, you're going to get a vector like, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Normalize, you know, does the, the requisite math to make it a unit vector so that, you know, the length is going to be exactly one. So basically that's going to make every, every bullet be exactly the same speed. And then the other thing uh, of it shooting entirely too many bullets, again, another pattern. Uh, let me see. Uh, Basically, what you're going to do is that as, as time moves on, you're going to accumulate the number of milliseconds that has passed. And then at a certain point, which let's say 100, uh, then you're going to be allowed to shoot. And then down here in the code, very simple, uh, you're going to say uh, bullet accumulator. You know, if you've already shot, you're going to reset it back to zero. Down here, bullet accumulator, you're going to add game time dot elapsed game time dot milliseconds and I forget if I have to scale that ah yeah I didn't think so uh, and then up here you know you're gonna shoot if the shoot length is greater than zero and if the bullet accumulator is greater than bullet rate. So with that, now you have a constant rate of fire. You can't shoot any faster than that. And again, you have all these little variables that you can tweak, which, you know, again, you wouldn't just have floating around in some random class variable. Um, but uh, so now we're, you know, we're getting pretty close or you know, to the actual game mechanics. Obviously, not the graphics, but uh, we're getting pretty close to the game mechanics. And you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, a lot of times, you will actually be able to to make very simple games and prove whether something's going to be fun or not before you actually spend a ton of time doing crazy graphics and getting artists and doing all this stuff. So for prototyping, this is great because you can make a game, prove that it's going to be fun, and then use that prototype. To, to maybe recruit other people. Um, there's a ton more that, that we could do with 2D, uh, but I actually wanted to show you guys you know, a, little, uh, a little bit of 3D here. So, um, let me see, 819. In the interest of time, in the interest of time, uh, we're gonna go through these very quickly. <laughs> um, so obviously, when you get into, uh, into the third dimension, you know, in addition to X and Y coordinates, uh, you're going to have a third, which is Z. Uh, I had my wife make, uh, uh, make me a little visual aid here. Uh, it's this way. Uh, and I'll just put it up here. So it doesn't, yeah. All right, so there's a few kind of core concepts that you uh, have to understand once you move into 3D, right? In 2D, there's a fairly limited amount of, uh, of information that you need to actually draw something on the screen. You need a, you know, a, a vector position, and you need a texture, and maybe a few other little odds and ends. Um, when it comes to 3D, you need a significantly you know, more amount of information. Um, one of the very core concepts uh, you know, is this con uh, concept of a camera in the 3D world. Uh, I'm actually a little surprised that Microsoft didn't have some abstraction for a camera, like, like some sort of built-in base class, because every game is going to need a camera. Um, but then at the same time, you, know, you kind of think, there's actually a, you know, a, very, a very large number of ways that you can define what is a camera to your game. Uh, and a bunch of different you know, just mathematical models that you can use to, to figure out the position and how you rotate it and all this stuff. So uh, you know, that may have contributed to it. But at its base, uh, you know, 3D math is all about translation and rotation and scaling. Uh, it uses matrix, you know, uh, four by four matrices uh, or matrices of, uh, of floats. 
Uh, and uh, there's a matrix class in the XNA framework that has a ton of really useful uh, you know, methods that help you do all these translations and rotations. Um, and the, this, this, concept, this, this concept of a camera, um, there's, three, there's three matrices that go into actually drawing something on the screen. Because this is, this is basically how you talk, how you instruct the, the, the graphics hardware. Look, this is what I want you to draw. Uh, the camera has what's called a view matrix, which is essentially saying this is the camera's position and orientation in the world. Uh, you know, you can kind of think of the camera, uh, well, as a camera, actually. The camera can be in a certain position, <laughs> ironically. Uh, the camera can be in a given position up here. It can be rotated. It can be rolled. You know, I can put it over here and point it down. Uh, so conceptually, it's exactly like a real camera. The camera also has a second, you know, matrix property. It's called, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be called the projection matrix. Uh, you can think of the projection matrix as the, the, the field of view of the camera, right? So, you know, even thinking of your own eyes, you know, you have a certain point where your peripheral vision kind of stops, you can't see more. That is your, you know, that is your, your you know, your field of view. I, I, I can only see this much of the world and I can only see so far, you know, uh, and, that's, and that's pretty much exactly what that, that matrix defines. The last one is a little bit tricky, um, and this is what's called the world matrix. Um, now, remember when I mentioned that you know game development in 3D is all about you know translations and rotations, uh, and I'm actually going to use this to demonstrate that. So, okay, when uh, uh, when you have an artist and say he he models a bottle, right? What he's going to do is that he's going to you know each one of these points in this bottle are all made up of uh, uh, what's called vertices, little points in 3D space. What he's going to do is that he's going to, he's going to uh, usually model it at the origin, right? So, so he's going to say that, you know, this very bottom of, uh, of the bottle is going to be at 0, 0, 0, at, you know, at the origin of the world. And every, like, you know, if it's one unit tall, maybe this, you know, like this vertice will be 1, uh, 0, 1, 0, because, you know, up on the Y. Um, so, so that's great and all, right? You know, uh, uh, you have some vertices, you know, between, you know, maybe they're the, 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 t the highest vertice is, is maybe, you know, one or something like that. Now, the way it works is that, say you have a camera, right, pointing over here, and, you know, you've done the work to translate the camera and, and, and tell the video card, look, you know, I want my camera over here pointing in this direction. And then what you do is that you kind of trick, you kind of trick the video card uh, into, you know, say say this is, you know, say that is the actual world, uh, you know, uh, the actual origin of the world. But really, you know, the camera's pointing over here, and you want to render it over here, and you want to make it a little bit bigger. So what you do is that you translate, you translate the world matrix for this guy. And then maybe you rotate it, and then maybe you, you scale it. You know, maybe you want a really big water bottle. And then you send all that information to the, to, to the graphics card. And based on all that information, that's what it uses to render something onto the screen. So do I, have, I am going to, I'm actually going to start a new project. Actually. You know what? I don't even need a new project. I'm just going to erase all this. All that code gone. I don't want to load that. OK. So we're starting, for the most part, from a clean slate. OK. Um, now, what I'm going to do, uh, like I mentioned, uh, when it comes to 3D, you've got a whole lot of more information that you need to manage. So in this little scurvy library over here, I've actually built you know, a few useful abstractions. For example, I've got a camera object, uh, and I've got a model sprite object, which is kind of similar to, to the other sprite uh, that I showed you. You can, you can give it a position in the world and things like that. Uh, so it kind of makes it easy to understand. 
So let's add a camera and a model into our world. <clears throat> so we'll add in some content that we have. Um, this, uh, this model that I'm going to add, I, I literally searched for free 3D models and I found it. You know, I didn't make any changes to it. So really you can kind of, and of course it has a horrible name, so I'm just going to change it to house. Uh, you can kind of consider this, you know, if you find an artist to help you over the internet, you know, he's going to send you some, some zip file that has a bunch of, you know, an, you know, a model file and it's going to have a bunch of textures and things like that. For, from the perspective of XNA Game Studio, you're going to have to worry about any of that, for the most part. Again, this is kind of on the simple scale. But, um, you know, just, uh, just, like, just like the texture. You come into load content, and you say, um, oh, actually, the camera. Um, the camera actually inherits from what's called a game component, which is, uh, which is a built-in XNA class. Let me see. Um, the great thing about game components is that it's, it, it's, it's kind of like a mini game from a structure perspective, has an update method, a load content method, you know, and all that stuff. So it kind of, uh, uh, if you'll remember with the bullets, I had to manually put in the loop and say update and draw and stuff like that. Uh, with a game component, you don't have to do any of that. So you can just say components add. And this is a really great way for people to share, you know, kind of normal components, like a camera. Again, every game is going to have a camera. So then over here, uh, I say, equals content.load, named it house, right? Yeah. And then uh, house equals new model sprite, house model. And, and then again, you know, I've given it a pretty simple API, this, this house model. So I just say house model draw, and you give it the camera, because again, when you go to draw a model, you need the view and projection matrix from the camera. So when I run that, and it's actually going through and building the model and you know doing all that stuff. So we have a 3D camera, uh, and in in my implementation of the camera, I actually made it work uh, very similar to uh, if you guys have ever played Halo or any of these first-person shooters. You know, you can look up and down, side to side. You can strafe. You can go backwards and forwards. Uh, and actually, right now, it's 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 essentially in flight mode. So if I look up, it kind of you know, you can go up. Um, the house is not moving. Uh, you know, the camera is moving, even though it's. I mean, it's kind of hard to tell because there's really nothing in relation the, uh, that you can gauge. So let's fix that. I happen to have found, you know, again, this was a completely random, you know, I just searched on the internet. I did not make this. So let's say rocks. So I'm going to use this, this rock sprite sheet as, as the floor, essentially. Uh, no, it's fine. Uh, it's still called house in the asset name. It just has that really funky name. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so rocks equals, again, using the content pipeline. You barely even have to think about it. Is that what I called it? Rocks, yeah. And again, um, hold on. Oh, yeah, the other thing. OK. Uh, actually, there's another class I'm going to bring in. This class I actually, for the most part, got. I've modified it a little bit. Uh, I got from one of the samples that's on the creator's uh, uh, XNA site. Um, it is, it's essentially a, a, you know, an open implementation or a, a much simpler implementation of the sprite batch. Uh, it doesn't do any batching or anything like that, but it essentially lets you, you know, it's, it's doing almost exactly what the sprite batch is doing. 
because even though the Sprite Batch has that, that nice 2D interface, what it's really doing behind the scenes is exactly what this is doing. It's making uh, a, what's called a quad, and it's positioning it in, you know, kind of perpendicular to the screen. So with this guy, he gives me a little bit more freedom. Uh, and like I said, I kind of made a few changes to him to make it easier. So once I have my quad, uh, so I've got the quad drawer, and I've got the rocks. And I have this handy dandy method called floor. Uh, let's say 32, we're going to scale it, and you pass in the camera. And there are build errors. Where is this? Oh. Uh, and I'll show you what, what that guy does. So now we have ground. And as you move around, you know, it's, it's a lot more apparent what's going on. You know, you can kind of move out. And of course, there's like massive tiling. You know, it doesn't really, you know, this is not something that you'd want to include in a, in a final game. Uh, but for the purposes of the presentation, you know, it does the job pretty good. You know, you can kind of go around to the front door, say, hi, how's it going? Oh, and of course, <laughs> you can fall right through the world, of course. So, okay, this is starting to look better, but it's still not great because you've got this really flat blue sky.